Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for coming to tonight's Event Tech Talks um, on the subject matter of the Internet of Things, or our, our toast as orange, as I call it. Um, we're going to start off with a pitch today from a new company called Zenus Biometrics. Um, they're a new exhibitor to Event Tech Live in November, but they've got some really interesting facial rec recognition technology um, that is also connected to the internet, so quite um, uh, topical. Um, we're going to go over to Panos, um, who's going to do a three-minute pitch, and then if you guys have got any questions about their technology, how it might help your events or help your technology that you guys deliver and stuff, then ask away. So over to Panos. Hi, uh, the event experience starts at registration. It has to be quick and it has to be easy. The day of the event, it is important to keep the line going because nobody likes waiting. Organizers get only one chance to make a lasting impression. Using the right solution is vital. Even though there are hundreds of registration platforms, they all repackage the same technologies, QR codes, Beacon, and RFID. All implementations revolve around the same technologies, and none of them is a clear winner. So hi, my name is Panos, and I'm the CEO of Xenus. We have developed powerful facial recognition technology, and we're bringing this exciting new uh, technology to the events industry. Our software is the most a fast, robust, and accurate solution in the market. So you can see it's very, very robust. <clears throat> Every event management software platform can integrate this technology in an easy and seamless way. So the process works like this. Before the event, the attendees can register with one click using their social media profiles. The registration platform will capture their contact information in their profile image. On the day of the event, the organizer can simply put a smartphone or any tablet facing the crowd, and that's it. The attendees will get checked in automatically as they walk by. On top of that, our service is very affordable and accessible even to event planners with limited budgets. We have already completed the first few integrations and in a few weeks, Yaya Reggie will be showcasing our technology in London at ICE Awards. So if you are there, you will see Xenus in action firsthand. So our business model relies on win-win partnerships with event management software platforms. So if you are one of them, please feel free to reach out and learn more. Thank you. Thank you, Panas. Has anybody got any questions from the audience? <coughs> Abe, I'll just throw you. There you go, man. <coughs> um, hi, Panos. Um, I was wondering how mm -hmm. reliable it is because I was thinking about um, when you uh, go to the sort of passport check it, or, you know, the, when they check your mm -hmm. passport and how sometimes you, you have to join another queue at that point. Um, what's the sort of mm -hmm. rate of, of reliability? Mm -hmm. So we only release uh, a version of the software if it is over 99 point something percent accurate. So it's always over 99 percent accurate. Having said that, all biometric systems mathematically will have some error rate. So this is something that people will, can find other ways to mitigate. Uh, if I may add one more point to that, there are two different ways to implement this technology. There are two different flavors in face recognition. One of them is what you mentioned in airports, where somebody is putting the passport, then the machine is taking a picture of their face, and it compares them. In this case, we have the second factor of authentication, and the goal is to increase security. Another application is you have a database of faces, for example, all the attendees registered in an event, and when somebody goes in front of the camera, the system is searching the database, finds the most similar face, and then makes a decision. Even though this is exponentially harder, 
as you may imagine, it can speed up check-in and registration significantly. In the demo I showed you earlier, we have the database of 300 people, and the system can search in real time and identify me correctly, even if we have you know, some occlusion. Okay, anybody else got any questions? Gentleman at the back, and then one down here, Callum. So in terms of how you integrate with third-party products, can you just talk us through how that would actually work in terms of your product going into a registration system or another third-party product? Sure, uh, my pleasure. So we use a cloud-based API service. What this means is that uh, if we say, if we imagine that our service is in a box, the registration platform will upload images and we will create the database. At the day of the event, you can submit requests and we will return the identity. So it is, uh, we have tried to make it simple as that. The commands that somebody needs to use to integrate our service is create person, upload image, submit a request to make an identification. It's that simple. So with the IRG, the integration process took a little bit less than, less than two weeks. So it's pretty straightforward. And one of the things that we do different, we really go the extra mile which means when somebody wants to integrate our service, we write code samples in the programming language of their preference, and we make sure to duplicate the same process in order to ensure that our support is going to really speed up the integration process. And Callum. Relatively similar mm -hmm. um, uh, question, but I guess slightly different. Um, do you have any experience or plans or have you uh, looked at how this integrates with uh, artificially intelligent registration systems, maybe something like a platform like IBM's Watson or something like that, um, where you've got a system that's trawling numerous databases and then using that facial recognition to, rather than register, identify an individual for further conversation or categorization, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So our goal at this stage was to provide one more tool to the event uh, management software platforms, and we want to let them uh, go wild, you know, start exploring different use cases. What you mentioned is one of these potential implementations. So they could take the Watson, like you mentioned, the IBM Watson, our service, and integrate them into a product. So we don't put any restrictions on the kind of product that people can build. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thanks, Panas. Sorry to the gentleman at the back. Did you have something to add? Panos, the, the question, just to go on from the earlier conversation, was will the system work at a native level as well as an online level? Uh, currently, we work only on uh, online, which means it requires to have internet connection. And the reason for that is the following. Searching large databases in an accurate way, it requires uh, lots of computational resources. And in order to make that real time, make it accurate, robust, and so forth, it has to be on the cloud. OK. Yeah, perfect. Um, Panos, thanks for your time. If people want to find out more about Xenus, where did they go? Uh, Xenus-biometrics.com. Thank you very much, Panos. Thank you for having me. Bye. OK, guys, so I'd like to invite our panel guests up to discuss the Internet of Things. If you guys want to come up. Um, while these guys come up, just to remind people, there's a few different ways that you can get involved with the panel and ask questions. Um, we have, just pop it on there for me. Um, we have the event app, which you can search on the App Store if you've not already got it under ETT17 or Event Tech Talks. Um, we have Me Too as well. Um, you can use the web URL that will be up on the screen in a little bit to submit your questions. If you do use that, and one of the questions is particularly directed at one of these guys, if you just mind putting who it's directed at, and then we'll go from there. Um, to start things off, though, we've got, well, to start and end things, we've got a poll at the start, just to get a, an idea of where you guys are at with the Internet of Things and what you know and what you maybe don't, and these guys have contributed to that. And then towards the end, we've got a little bit of a quiz, just something fun to finish things off. So, guys, are we going to the poll?
while you while they're pulling the poll up, do you guys want to introduce yourself? Tim, we'll, we'll start with you. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm Tim from a um, Tim Manning from a, a company called Swarm Swarm Group. We're a, a typical marketing communication agency, um, and we work quite broadly. We work um, in in verticals that include events, but we work across retail um, and quite heavily in experiential marketing as well. So that's the probably middle ground between the two, between retail and, uh, and events. Clemmy. Um, hi, I'm Clemmy. I'm from a company called Noodle Live. Uh, we're an event technology company and um, we work with RFID and mobile apps to give event planners the tools they need to quantify events in the same way as other marketing channels. And Callum? Uh, I'm Callum Gill. Uh, I'm Head of Insight and Innovation at DRP. We're a creative experience agency, do a lot of work in, in events. The reason why I suppose I'm here is because I have to sit at the, the forefront of the new technology that we explore and try and implement within those event solutions and the other solutions that we do. So hopefully I've got a good overview of the kind of stuff that we're talking about here today. Hopefully a better, a better overview than I had as well, because before two weeks ago, I didn't really have a clue what the internet of things was, but it seems that it's everything um all right guys so if you guys want to either go onto the app or the meeting id that was just up there i think you've all been getting your phones out and doing that anyway we'll start the poll how many devices or internet of things do you personally own or use do you think <laughs> count down no, no, we are, yeah. <laughs> Do we all pop up or something? Yeah. Somebody gets a teapot at the end of it. I did call. That was on camera. Right, right, game on. The licensing for the countdown music was a bit too expensive. Though, so yeah, yeah. The audio networks version. <laughs> okay, so that's interesting. Most of you definitely own something that you believe is the Internet of Things. <coughs> and and it, for me, it was things like VR headsets and Fitbits and all those are now classed as the Internet of Things. So it's pretty much everybody is having one device or more on them as part of that mm. group of things. So, next, qu next poll question. Interesting one to see where people think what's more complimentary. Mm. What do you think? <coughs> yes. Yeah. But it's got to be contextually correct, it's got to be, it's got to be added some value. Yeah. So. Okay, so AR, and VR and AI will be complementary. 60% of you say yes, <coughs> somebody said no, or well, a couple of people said no, and others are not sure, so hopefully we'll be able to explore that a little bit yeah, later yeah, with what you yeah. said, Tim. Next question. The naysayers. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away yeah, from the technology. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's smash the machines. Smash the machines. <laughs> right. Ooh. So there's nobody that wouldn't at least consider it, which is positive, because otherwise they'd probably be in the wrong room. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be, you know, extreme. It could be, here it could to, be yeah, extreme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next question, guys. Which is as much short as well. I think this is a really interesting point because yeah. processes around events is where usually people look for solutions. Yeah. Listen, I thought this was probably a granular question. You, you I've never found here. a phone or anything with voice control that can understand me. Yeah, well, you're, from, you're from Cornwall, aren't you? So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Have you tried an Alexa? It gets my Yorkshire accent. Well, I, just, yeah. I did anyway. They no. Did, they did a lot of work specifically around that. What, around like Yorkshire? Dialect. Well, around, <laughs> yeah, around dialect, yeah. 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 yeah, Scottish was by far the most challenging. Uh, wow. Well. Interesting. Yes. These are just some of the points we'll explore a little bit later once we've done the poll. Um, we go to the next question, guys. There is another one. I think that was the last. Mm -hmm. Now this is an interesting one, especially with GDPR on our horizon in a year's time or less now. I suppose consumers could also be event attendees as well, even exhibitors, sponsors. 
internal meetings whether staff should have the right to opt out. Okay, so some people don't think we should have the right to opt out of those <coughs> elements of stuff. That's interesting. Next question, guys. I think that's the same one. But join the music. You can change your answer. Yeah. <laughs> if you said no, you were wrong. <laughs> All right, so that's the end of the poll. So I think that gives us some basis of some stuff to discuss while we're having the panel discussion. But yeah. I think for me, um, my comment earlier about orange toasters was really where my knowledge was before a couple of weeks ago because it's, it's something that I've seen on the headlines, but it's nothing that I've ever really delved into as to what it means. So, Claire, I'm going to start with you, pick you out. What does the Internet of Things actually mean? What does it cover? Well, to me, I mean, I think that, you know, there's lots and lots of different definitions of this, but I think, you know, for me, it always means the interaction between kind of the physical environment and digital hardware, you know, it really is anything that kind of facilitates the intersection of those kind of two elements, I guess, if you can call it, if you can call it that. And, you know, for, for in what we do um, as an event technology company, you know, that's very much the, the kind of... Um, what what our customers are looking for, what Internet of Things means to them, and so where our focus has been. I'm sure that um, Callum and Tim, with their sort of wider experience that isn't so solely focused on the event industry, will probably have a few things to add to that definition. I mean, I think <coughs> the facilitation is is the the key word that you use there because it's about interoperability, the internet of things, the way in which things communicate with one another, the, you know, defining products as internet of things products is problematic because internet connected devices have outnumbered human beings on planet earth since about 2005 at a rate of about nine to one. So why weren't we talking about the internet of things then when all those things could connect to devices? The reason was is because they couldn't communicate with one another and they couldn't do so independently of our input in order to make things easier for us. That was the kind of game changer around 2012 when things started to be able to speak to one another and carry out actions and operations without our uh, intervention to make them happen. And that's really where the internet of things lies in that interoperability and the API as we were talking about mm -hmm. before. And I think, I think I'd think i add to that, um, you know, that physical digital thing, <coughs> I'd put the human lens into it as well because let's take let's take our, uh, an event let's take event as a silo let's look at the, the the pain points within an event and I think that's where the internet of things can start to affect some of those pain points to make them easier frictionless better to handle better <coughs> to deal with quicker whatever the outcome is that we're really looking for gather more data so I think there's a human part to it too so what are those real problems as event organizers where there's a, a human challenge and then internet of things can come together to actually solve some of those issues so let me throw a question back at you then if it's been around for so long why all of a sudden does it seem to be the new thing and something that's so big we've now got major events specifically for internet of things we see it in large technology providers um you know marketing there and internet of things provider and corporates and even us in an industry has now started to take some real notice about what does this mean for us. Why is it why is it taking so long to get there if it's always been there, always been there for a long time? I think it's just really you know what's the is the current zeitgeist you know it's the buzzword. It's like social media had been around for a long time before that became the word on everyone's lips. And you know as as Callum was saying you know this has been around for a long time. But I think you know. It's, it's almost become a marketing term in itself. But I, d I don't think that, that necessarily has to be a bad thing because I think when, you know, you have these definitions that are, of co like, in the sort of public sphere, then, you know, it's assisting with the evolution of what that concept essentially if more people are discussing and more people are understanding it we've got more brains thinking about how it can be used and it's such a kind of wide-reaching term that it's I think it would be difficult to um to you know you can't pigeonhole it in just to one industry and I think that's what makes it really interesting and I think the I think the other thing is that um you've got to have the the devices have got to be able to connect to each other so there's got to be a broad enough ownership of those devices for them to be able to function so five years ago if we'd all turned up at an event and people didn't have a smartphone in their pocket 
the Internet of Things couldn't even communicate with your phone. Mm -hmm. So, so that um, uh, ubiquitous sort of nature of, of the ownership of those devices that can communicate with the infrastructure that event organiser might put in are obviously critical to the, the spread and the success. So as an industry, do you, are, you, are you saying that we're waiting to be able to capitalise on this by consumers having the devices as and when they turn up rather than trying to provide them technology, they have the technology and then we can capitalise on those opportunities? Yeah, it, it, it absolutely has to be that. It's, it's an unfortunate chicken and egg scenario, um, which is... There's, a, there's quite a lot of reticence, especially internally and surrounding data externally, with putting the power effectively in the hands of the people and their own devices and using own device. But without it, it's largely impossible to affect the kind of uh, interoperability that we're talking about that we need for the Internet of Things at, um, at events. Um, you know, the, the vanguard of these type of technologies to start with were all in the background. I think we were talking about it before, you know, measuring the, the movements of farmer machinery and livestock and stuff like this and not very sexy things that are difficult to sell to the public. But now everybody has one of these devices in their pocket. And I think it was a survey that was done by Wired a year ago or a year and a half ago that said that 97% of people in the UK now have a smartphone or a smart device. And that's quite amazing when you think that we've got an aging population. And to be fair, quite a lot of those devices were probably given by younger, relevant, younger relatives and you know have never been opened and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, <laughs> it, that even if that isn't quite the nature of penetration that we're talking about, it's still a huge amount. So people need to get on board with the fact that making sure that when we're talking about utilising the Internet of Things at events that we're talking about on people's own devices and not on something that we give out. We had, we had a, an experience maybe... Maybe it was about four years ago or something like that, so not quite when it was at the zenith that it is at the moment, but we gave out loads of um, iPads to people at the event. And there was a lot of people at the event, and there was over 2,000, um, and they all have geotagging on them, obviously, so we know where they all are, so no, none of them go walkabouts, and five didn't come back in. And uh, someone <coughs> left, left one in their bag by accident, as you can probably imagine. We found four in the bins. Yeah. Um, so people had just gone, oh, it's not mine, not using them anymore, chuck, it, chuck them in the bins at the end. We fished them out, obviously, because we knew where they were, but we really need to get the concepts that we're delivering onto people's own devices and make sure that they're accessible and usable there because that's what people use every day. Mm. Absolutely, and I think, you know, just on a sort of, from a budget perspective, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really viable to give um, people, you know, 2,000 people iPads. I mean, that must have been a fairly large budget, large budget event. And, you know, especially if you're looking at events that have got, you know, 10, 20, 30, 100,000 people attending them, then it really does have to be led, led by, the end, the, the, by your own device. And I think, you know, um, I, th I think another thing we were discussing before, you know, the recent Apple developer conference, you know, for us, the, the NFC sort of chip being opened up, that, that, that I think makes it really viable and really a really tangible thing that, you know, people can start using their own device device to interact with a physical environment they can already interact with other devices just due to the nature of the operating system but um, and you know what cross operating system as well but um you know that was that was the really that's sort of really exciting for us at noodle so do you want to just expand on that a little bit clever then when you're talking about an attendee or even us as you know technology providers being able to capitalize on them open apple opening up that platform now what opportunities does that present as, as, a, as an event industry enabled? You know, what can we enable attendees to do and what information and, and what extra things can we do as an organiser? Sure. Well, I, I think that a lot of the time, you know, technology isn't really enabling you to do anything new. It's just making it easier or streamlining that process. And I think that you know, that's number one. We don't want to be using a bit of technology just for the sake of it. It can't be a gimmick. We've got to be thinking about what data we're trying to collect and how we're using these tools to collect that data or create a better experience for our attendees. And also, you know, so just really kind of starting from what are our aims, what are our objectives, who are our stakeholders, what does success look like, and what do I want the report to look like the end of it and that's kind of you know should be the, the the conversations leading any procurement in this area but I think in terms of what it can actually do I mean um, you know I'm sure that some of you have used um, like you know RF, like smart badge systems or you know um, sort of NFC enabled devices that you've been given at an event so that you can go and tap at different points 
And that w what that essentially is is that um, you know badge or that that device has got a, a tag in it that links it links um, that device to you, and then you tap at a pod, and that pod communicates with the server. What we're doing now is we're going to flip around the process in that instead of having to go and install all of this hardware at events, we're going to be able to ship out you know, smart posters to people that have got the tag in them, and then it will be your phone that reads that poster and, and um, you know, performs whatever action is associated with that. So an example, like tap this poster to check in, rather than you know, tap on an Oyster card star reader. Um, tap here to view um, a push notification about where my next session is, or you know, tap here to instantly collect content content or swap contacts with people. I mean, you know, I could, I could, and probably if I was allowed to, would go on for quite a long time. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of, you know, I'm not going to win the teapot or any friends <laughs> like that. So, um, I, you know, and I think, um, you, you know, but it's, it's always the, you know, we were discussing this in the office, obviously it's been like pretty much all we've been talking about for the last week. And, you know, that, we are, even with that development, you know, it's always going to be a gradual uptake as with any sort of te technology adoption. You know, we are still, as a company, we can't just say, right, we're just not going to do RFID anymore because, you know, A, people want badges because people want to know what people's names are. B, not everybody's going to have an NFC-enabled phone. And, um, well, actually, I actually don't have a C, just those were the two things to so. say. A and B. A and B. Yeah. Tim, you, you work with some quite high profile clients on some really interesting projects. What are some of the questions and, and reasons that companies that you work with want to kind of capitalise on, you know, technologies that are connected to the internet for their events? Okay, so I think we've got, you know, you've got a, a client has a challenge. They, there's, there's a lot of technologies available in the event sector and a client is expected to be the authoritative brief. They're meant to be able to ask quite concisely what they would like this client, this um, event to look like and what technology they can use. And um, these technologies, the Internet of Things, are not a can of beans. So it's very hard to brief an event agency, a creative agency, a strategic agency, a, a Markham's agency, whoever is sitting in that role, to say, this is what we would like that event to look like. And I think the briefing process is one of those challenges and issues. So it's often that we'll take a brief and we'll have to then almost rebrief back to the client to say, I know you were asking for this, but do you mean this? You know, and it's it's a it's a it, and then there's got to be a trust element there for that to then work to say, okay, so you mean there are so other solutions to be able to gather the data that we need to be able to get the contextual cross swapping of information such as the stuff that Clemmy says there where you actually touch for content and things like that to realise there's other ways to do it. So there's got to be a trust on the events agency, the delivery agencies then. And I think that bias, that balance has got to change a little bit if we're going to really harness these technologies until until there's wide enough knowledge. Well, it's yeah. really like understanding what they're trying to achieve because, yeah. you know, I want it all to be integrated via API. No, why do you want it? And, and then, you know, using your expertise to actually, you know, construct a solution that will achieve those goals. Yeah. While we were talking about what, what, you, what you can actually do, the biggest problems for us is, uh, in the space of delivery is, is educating people about what you can do. And um, one of those uh, companies that's kind of like at the forefront of deliver delivering the Internet of, of Things experience to consumers is surprisingly enough, it's in home and heating. Um, the, some of the most common products that you'll see are Nest, Hive, Wave, uh, these kind of things. Uh, and I've seen, because um, uh, one of our clients works in this field, um, the kind of way that they look at educating customers in this field. And they have four types of individuals. They have DIYers, those who will buy products, fit them themselves, <laughs> and, and do it all themselves. People who, get, who, people who uh, are kind of sort of like DIYers, but they'll go out and buy it, but then they want someone to sort it out for them. Then two other types, which are people who know they want something, but don't know what it is and people who don't know what they want. And clients who are after Internet of Things type solutions at events fall into those last two categories pretty much every time. They either know they want something, but they don't know what it is, or they don't know what they want. I actually think there's another type, and that's the person that comes and has always done something the way they've done it, and they don't want to change. You know, we've there's so much technology out there in the event space now, as Tim rightly said, and our expectation is that people will come and they will uptake naturally. 
mm. and you've got you know you've got different events with different ranges of people's understanding knowledge technology uptake in their own personal life and i think you're right the education piece sometimes is the most important piece because ultimately how can you expect somebody to use something yeah. if they don't understand how yeah. to? You don't want to be a harbinger of fear when you're having these kind of conversations, but I often use the example when I'm talking to people who are reticent about this stuff of why when you go home at night and you're sitting down and you're choosing something to stream on your TV, are you not doing it through Blockbuster? There's absolutely no excuse for Blockbuster not being the dominant force in online streaming and media, and it was for exactly those reasons. There was a quote from the CEO um, maybe four years before they went under that said, the reason why we're not investing in taking our services <coughs> online, and that was into online media delivery, so sending DVDs through the post at that time, is because people still want the experience of going into the shop, choosing the DVD from the rack, buying the sweets as well, and they couldn't see the writing was on the wall. And with regards to the Internet of Things, that's exactly the case for those kind of people. As this stuff becomes further and further integrated into the home space, which is a similar space to people experiencing events, you eat there, you, you learn there, you do stuff there, venues, all that kind of stuff, when that becomes so integrated into everyday life, ex exactly like Clemmy was saying, in the way that we take these things up, it's not going to be a choice, it's going to be a must-have. And so how far behind will you be when it becomes a must-have, mm. when you have to start integrating how, how, it? How far are we away from it being a must-have? It depends on the area, yeah. really, and the type of thing within the Internet of Things. I think there's a, there's a, there will be a tipping point, but it's, you know, it, the events industry is one of those industries that's ripe for disruption. And I think, as Callum said, um, you know, things like box manufacturers have been measuring boxes using RFID and NFC mm -hmm. for years. Mm -hmm. They know the box has been packed and sealed and it's gone off and it's gone onto a truck and they know which truck it's in. Uh, retailers who I work with have been measuring stock for years using RFID. They know where every item of cloth is, whether it's gone to the sales floor, whether it's been sold, has it been returned. They know exactly where it is. They're tagging it and they're following it and they're trailing it around. Whereas the events hall, the expo hall, has looked exactly the same as the expo hall looks for years. I still get my paper catalogue at the mm -hmm. beginning. I, I might get an app now. Do I? Don't I? It's probably 50-50. Maybe it's about 80-20 actually now. So an app's probably almost that must-have now. I would say so. Yeah, so you've got to have that delivery. But then what happens as I wander around all of the little booths? So these guys have paid a lot of money in an expo hall. They've still got their cubicle. They're still communicating their message like a market stall. They've got some screens to communicate the things with. But... Where's the transactional trade? When am I really digitally and physically exchanging stuff through the Ethernet, through the cloud? And that's where the Internet of Things can really start to take some of the friction away from those processes. Because there's only so much I can say when I'm a market stall trader. So there's, a, there's always, a, it's always a good yeah. reason when there's a pain point to try and find a solution. Yeah. You know, yeah. Getting into events is, as we've seen <coughs> with Zenus, and I know some other technologies have been discussed in terms of getting into an event, generally is one of ma anybody's major pain points. Nobody really likes to queue, although we do it really, really well in this country. <laughs> Nobody still wants to do it. Queuing for catering, coffee, finding, navigating your way around a, a, an exhibition or an event or a conference or whatever it is, being yeah. in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And I think with large events, whether that be exhibitions, conferences or congresses, finding the people that you want to speak to in the short amount of time. Because I think the average dwell time on, on most events, especially when they're free to attend in their exhibition format, is actually yeah. quite low. You know, it's like up to two hours maybe yeah. for most yeah. people. They don't spend all day, do you? So the pain points, how can, how can the Internet of Things solve some of those pain points of just what, you know, what people do now? So if I, if I just throw... So I was, I was in a meeting this afternoon with, um, with a, a, an API that will link into uh, any app. You can scan an event space, you can put all the different suppliers and you can say, I would like to meet six widget manufacturers. You can filter that out. The app will then guide you in a route to meet all six widget manufacturers. It will give you their web addresses, it will put whatever images in place, it will put YouTube stock. So before I meet those six, I could filter them down to four by saying, OK, which of those I'll just put on the hotspots on the app. And then I get my really efficient journey through that 1,000 person exhibition, 10,000 person, 100,000 exhibition hall. So, you know, there are tools there that can give us the one thing that we can't replace, and that's time. And to be efficient in an exhibition hall, get what you want and actually walk out without a bag of stuff. <laughs> Instead, walk out with, a, with some real meaning and value from that exhibition is, in fact, what we're all searching for. We all want to go in there and have those, those networking chats. We want to meet the right people. We want to meet the right suppliers. So 
internet of things I think can give us something that we can't replace and that's time and, and that's things like that in the exhibition space are happening right now um, when we're all done here if you've got five minutes you can uh, go away and google um, <coughs> what happened at last year's Detroit Motor Show uh, and I'm sure some of you may be familiar with eye beacons so they're like little rocks that sit on the wall RFID, <laughs> NFC um, enabled and what they did what they used them there for was taking the registration data of everyone that registered uh, and as they were moving around the venue, pinging push notifications to their phone saying, you're right next to a stand that you said that you were interested in and you want to see. So rather than just walking past it blithely, you could actually stop and have a conversation with someone and that person would also be notified at the same time who's on the stand and say, this person is now approaching a stand. They could go up to you, talk to you by name, give you that personal experience straight away. The other thing that the organisers were using it for was, so at exhibitions you get complaints, don't you, especially from people who are exhibiting. I'm right <coughs> next to the toilets, nobody's coming here, you know, it's all, it, I haven't seen anyone in the last half an hour, whatever it might be. So what they could do is then push out notifications through the iBeacon system to people's phones and say, visit this stand now because they're giving away this or there's a prize draw or whatever it is and drive tra traffic to underexplored areas of the exhibition. And it's a personalised way using IoT to make sure that both exhibitors and delegates get the maximum out of their experience in that kind of space. Just to, just to throw a spanner down there, there Callum, with, and I don't want to make this specific event about GDPR, but with GDPR coming and such tight reins around how people opt in so their data being used, even when they're on event site, is, is that going to cripple some of the opportunities that we're going to have with this technology that people won't want to opt in and therefore it'll be a fragmented experience? I think, you know, with that personal, you know, you're also talking about personalisation, which is, you know, obviously what the, the aspect of the data capture that benefits the, um, the attendee in, in this scenario, the data benefits the organiser. And, you know, I think that, you know, people are super happy to give all their data to Facebook, Instagram, because they're getting a really, they're getting something super compelling back, right? So, you know, that this kind of concept of data currency, I think, is going to become even more pertinent. You know, the offering, the, the how you're <coughs> positioning what they're going to get if they do opt in it's almost going to become a marketing exercise and yeah sure there'll be obviously like compliance measures that we're all going to be bound to put in place and make sure that we're complying with the new legislation but I, I still see it as if you are saying download this because you're going to get x y and z and you're making a comp you're presenting a compelling value prop then you know I'm happy to give my data. It's my little like bargaining chip. This is how I get my free social network to communicate mm. with my friends. But you know, also on the other hand, there's going to be, I think, a little bit more consciousness about what people are sharing, and and you you know, people are already you know that the the response to that poll of should people be able to opt in and out of Internet of Things. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be optional. They will have to, but you know, people are privacy conscious, and so it will you know you know, that, that will kind of impact it too. It's a, it's a generational and a cultural thing as well, mm. how much data that you give away. And um, I think it's by 2020, 48% of uh, the average organisation in the UK will be made up of people born in the <coughs> millennial generation who have much less of an issue sharing data, um, they share what they have for breakfast on social media every single day. They really don't mind about windows into their life. And the interesting thing to consider as well, and there's a lot more understanding around the fact that the internet isn't free, uh, and the services that everybody enjoys every day are not free, and that you either have, the, have a choice, you either pay, with them, pay for them with real money, or you pay for them with your data. And that's the only two ways that you can, that you can pay for these things. Um, anybody heard of the company Jawbone? They're like a fitness tracker. They have just um, withdrawn all tech support from the UK. So now if you have one, it's unsupported and slowly dying because they couldn't afford to keep it up in the UK anymore because so many people were opting out of supplying with them the data that they needed to sell on in order to keep it afloat. So if we don't allow uh, data freely to flow between two people for a positive outcome for both, then we will lose these services because they cost money and nothing is free. Does the Internet of Things give us the opportunity, hypothetically, where we could trade with the attendee the access to the event for us to resell and use their sponsorship with brands and corporates and things like that? So let's take, for example, a concert, because that's probably the most consumer-facing 
type of event. It's got big brands and big sponsors behind it generally. 85 quid, 95 quid for a ticket. Is, is that something, could we give another option with the Internet of Things if you're saying, give me your information and data that we can reuse and then collect that in different ways at the event? Is that already happening? Yeah, I mean, abso absolutely. Mm. You know, it's all just a massive data ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, mm -hmm. it, 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 if, I was to, if I'm to interact in an event and I go and buy my coffee from this place instead of this place and then I go and buy, you know, this bit of merchandise instead of that bit of merchandise and then that data gets passed on to a marketing department, it goes into all sorts of re, um, you know, retargeting campaigns, remarketing campaigns, um, you know, the ad tech that is out there is insane. We do an ad tech conference every year and it's my favourite client event because you just sit and listen to quite how terrifying it is, but it's, it's pretty awesome. And so they can get that data, you know, of course it's going to be valuable. Data is the most valuable thing in the world. And you, we've always got to remember in this situation as well, especially with regards to our purposes, marketing purposes or anything like that, the data that we collect isn't about finding out who you are. The, the data and us, we don't care who you are. What we care about is what you like, what you, what you want to do, how you purchase, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't matter whether there's a name attached. We can attach a number to it with no discernible name or identity because that's not what we're interested in. It's about how we can use that information to then further the purpose either in a positive way for you or a positive way for us or whatever it might be. And the fear is all around they know who I am, where I live and all this kind of stuff. And marketers and, and event marketers, we don't really care about that stuff. It's not callous, but we don't need to know. We don't want to know. Yeah, and in a way, I don't... I sort of don't see what has changed too much from, you know, now that it's digital. It's just digital. You know, we went to book a holiday 20 years ago. We gave them our name, address and telephone number, where we were going on holiday, the dates. You know, so is someone going to burgle my house? Well, actually, the travel agent knows. So did Thomas Cook. So, do, you know, all it is now, it's just digital. It's just slightly more fluid in the way that it's, it's, it's served up and it's moved around. And but, portable. Yeah, yeah, it is, but it's, it's, it was still there. And Thomas Cook, do you think 20 years ago they weren't selling their database? Do you think they weren't selling stuff so you could get stuff through the post in print? Of course they were. So, in fact, not a lot has changed. We've just started putting all these flags up by going, oh, my God, people know me. But I guarantee I'm looking at a lot of people here, and you all have LinkedIn profiles. I'd say 99% of you. I'd pr say probably 80% of you are on Facebook. I'd say, so, in fact, the amount that an event organiser needs is a tiny little bit along the surface to make a cracking event for you to personalise an experience to you. It is just the flotsam and jetsam on the top that an event organiser needs to absolutely change your world in that event hall tomorrow. And, and how, so how it is isn't deep. How is it externally? Yeah, yeah. It's not at all, really. It's there. You know, you could Google any one of us and yeah. stuff comes up, so. Not know. me. Do not Google <laughs> me. Um, stuff we don't see. <laughs> yeah. um, there's, there's a few questions been submitted by me too, so I want to make sure we get through those. Um, I'm not going to do them in a particular order, but I will start with one that has got um, for upvotes, which is, can you give a practical example of where IoT is being used in a really good way at the moment at an event? Um, I give you a cracking event that's a brand event. So we worked on this, we worked on it a few times, but it's um, and this is this is out there. We're just starting to hear it. So in the automotive sector, we work with Ford. Ford, six years ago, seven years ago, I was driving Ford Transit vans that were talking to each other. The Transit vans were talking to the traffic lights. The traffic lights were telling the vans we're going to put our brakes on. Uh, sorry, that we're going to go to red. The the brakes were therefore being applied on the vans. That's six, seven years ago, guys. It's where, you know, we had cars that you could drive at 70 miles an hour at things and the car would take over because it would be identified through cameras, internet of things, stuff happening to look at the environment, to feed back to the car, say, you're going to hit something if you carry on, and it would take control of the car and steer it around. So that stuff is out there to create an event around that to then help people to understand what is being used and what is around there was our skill and I'll be in that particular event. So. Guys, have you got anything to add to that? Um, I went to an event for a technology company not too long ago where um, their, um, it was Google, where their AI was effectively running the show in terms of the, the delegate experience. You were led round by it. Your information that you supplied to it pre-event uh, was uh, accessible, so I let it have access to my Google Assistant. Uh, you know, for better or for worse, to give me a bit better experience there. Uh, and it directed me to the things that I was most interested in um, 
via lights in the event. So when I walked in, some people were directing down the yellow path. I was being directed down the red path to go and see the stuff that I wanted to go and see, uh, as opposed to that kind of stuff. And there was no human interaction managing that whatsoever. It was all done through the fact that I already have Google pretty much sending out its tendrils into my life anyway. I don't know if you guys see this, but like in the morning when I wake up now, um, I get a little buzz on my phone that says, you need to leave now to get to work because there's been a crash or something like that. And it knows how I normally get to work. Hasn't quite learned that I cycle most days yet. But um, I, I think you're right. I think that's the most compelling use of Internet of Things or any technology events where it personalises the experience almost invisibly yeah. for an attendee to get mm. the most out of an event. And that means different things for different people all going to the same event. So if it can be harnessed in that way, I think that's my, my most compelling use case I've come along at the mm. moment is personalisation. I think as well, you've, but you've got to have a, some sort of, you've, it's got to be so carefully considered when you're coming up with, you know, the creative and the concept for the event of how am I going to get this data in the first place to personalise the experience? So I think that's one of our like big frustrations. They're like, I want to personalise everything. We, we, like, we can do this. When did your pre-registration launch? Well, actually, the event is in like seven days. I'm like, well, we don't actually, <laughs> hey, we can't do that, but, you know, Maybe a bad example, but uh, maybe a little bit longer than that. But you know, like if you haven't asked those questions or you don't have a link into something like Google Assistant, then your scope mm. for being able to personalise that experience is limited. It's so much more powerful, you know, when you can ask, you know, okay, right, pre-registration form. You can ask them what their T-shirt size is, what their coffee choice is, um, you know, whether they're vegetarian. So when they like go up to get their coffee, they tap their badge, or you know, they wave their phone, and then it tells the barista what mm. coffee to make them, or you know, beacons mm. when they're approaching it. The the you know barista has a screen which displays like this person with and possibly even brings up your face wants a mocha or or, a, or cappuccino or whatever. And I think you know, so that it still requires careful planning. It's not a case that technology can't do it. Technology can do most things, but you need to you know the, the starting point for these for executing this is quite often way before what people consider it is. Mm. We've, we've spoken a lot about the attendee experience and, and, you know, at the event and things like that. But for me, some of the most important technology out there for the events industry is the thing that affects the time that the event organiser has to plan, deliver and after the event wrap up. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's a question here that's been um, submitted by somebody anonymous that, that kind of gives us the Internet of Things in the home energy which um, sector which you mentioned earlier, Callum was that there is an ability to provide a cost saving ultimately to the consumer mm -hmm. and then hopefully better buying power and, and more profits for the energy provider as well. So as an organiser, as an industry, is there any examples or is there anything out there that you think that the Internet of Things can make an effect on which will actually provide a better bottom line or increased profits or sponsorship opportunities or anything like that for the sector using the Internet of Things? Well, so certainly just diving straight into it digital transactions rather than print transactions. So I was at Retail Design Expo two weeks ago and I still get a thick encyclopedia with all of the attendees. You know, it's great, but it's not really, is it? Why, why, why isn't that online? And also, it's not searchable. So when I do things now, like you guys, I put things in a box and I find all those suppliers that I actually want to speak to by putting it in a box. I don't do it by flicking paper as my first port of call. So there's, I don't know what the saving is, but, you know, there's 15,000 attendees a day across two days there. So, you know, there's a cost saving for the organiser. And also transactionally, there's a saving for the attendee. Because I don't want to carry that book around all day. Mm. I really, you know, I really don't. So, you know, there's, there's, there's an immediate, but it's, it's a very small transactional exchange. But there's value from both sides. And I think when you get value from both sides then you start to get those opportunities where you can say, okay, where are the touch points in an event where I can create those opportunities? As an exhibitor, how can I give somebody some really good, insightful information without me having to spend 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, or them being bored because they want to move on? How do I exchange that very, very quickly? And so I think that's, that's where the, the personalization can really come in to add some value. Um, so if we, kind of, if we kind of move into a world where um, at the outset your delegates, your event attendees, or whoever they might be, have accepted your invasion of their data pri privacy, and you can go in there and harvest that kind of stuff. What Google did in the situation that I was talking about, and what they do every day with uh, Google Assistant, um, is they use APIs to harvest this information from the wider web. They don't invent it themselves, they don't create it themselves. 
they don't they don't need to because traffic networks and and apps exist that do it whether the weather channel is a huge data uh, operating service so imagine a system whereby someone has agreed to download your event based app or whatever it might be and then on the day of the event you know Effectively, when you go on a website and you look at attendance of a, an event that you don't have to be there, it's not a company event, you've got to make a choice to, as to whether or not you're going to, you're going to go. Uh, you look for attendees, how many people came last year, all that kind of stuff. That's where the sponsorship value is when you go and you sell that kind of stuff to clients and things like that. So if you could encourage uh, people on the fence... They've registered, but they, may, they might not turn up. And you can tell them, well, if you go now, you can travel this way and you'll get there quicker. It's raining outside. Bring an umbrella. Here's what we've got waiting for you with all this <coughs> stuff. And it's done automatically without you having to put any input or any time into it whatsoever. That's a much better experience for everybody. And it will encourage more people through the door without a shadow of a doubt. And the next year, that little number on your website that says how many people attended is higher. And you can sell more sponsorship, get more um, exhibitors. All that kind of stuff fits in nicely in that kind of that kind mm -hmm. of ecosystem. We've mentioned already technology that people have and you use this using Google Assistant quite quite regularly by the sounds of things and, and earlier men you mentioned um, apps Tim although mm -hmm. apps seem to have a, a lower adoption um, in terms of technology at, at events. Is there technology already in people how, how do people tap into those resources that people already got? How do they tap into the Internet of Things through Facebook and WhatsApp and, and all these kinds of technologies? How do they hook themselves into that and deliver information to the attendee when they've already got it, so there's no barrier to entry. Well, I think it was it was mentioned on an earlier presentation. Um, single single button sign in through social media networks immediately open and connect you to that social network for that individual. Okay. So as soon as I use my Google account, therefore it knows it knows about my Google ecosystem, or it has the potential to use my Google inc inc uh, ecosystem. And the same for Facebook, the same whichever social media channel you wish to use. Okay. So I think that's one immediate connection. And I don't know whether you guys sit that in your APIs in the back and you have single button sign-ins. I mean, I think it's, it, it, it kind of depends on the client. Like some mm -hmm. of our clients really yeah. want that. Other people want <coughs> a completely, they want to emulate the benefits that those public social media um, portals mm -hmm. offer. So they want to be able to give people the option to communicate and and um, you know share their experience but they want a level of control and you can tell I'm probably talking about um, <laughs> several large financial corporates um, <laughs> and um, you know and I think you know so it really is it, it, it kind of comes back to what I probably Evan's getting so bored of me saying this but you know what are the aims what are the objectives what, you know what are the considerations that need to be taken into account in terms of you know security and um, you know um, integrate a API integrations, whether it is with you know existing mm -hmm. social networks where you've already got a data footprint, um, y you know it, we, it's it's all that's the kind of challenge of events is mm -hmm. that every single one is different, every single one has got a different set of stakeholders. So I think that regardless of how mm -hmm. IoT evolves for the events industry, you know modularity and flexibility is going to have to be at the core of these platforms to meet these different sets of needs. But I, I also you know adding to that, I, I love. What Callum said about you know trying to get people to attend the event and making that frictionless mm. and seamless and it, back to something that you know I all really dear, which is the human lens. So you know that person's waking up in the morning. How easy can you make it to get them to that event? And how many carrots and tokens can you put in their way that will encourage them and hook them to actually attend that event? And I think that's a really compelling sort of lens to sort of think about: is how can we get them to actually be there? Because how many sign up and don't show? Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. Well, we're running out of time, and I do want to make sure that we get this quick fire quiz in there for people. So, if people want to jump back on the phones and go back into Me Too, whether that was via the web link or through the app, we'll do a quick fire <coughs> quiz. Just a bit of fun and some knowledge around IoT that you can share with your friends around the pub <laughs> or your family or at Christmas. We don't win it. No, you're not allowed. <laughs> you scared me. Earlier. You were saying you were giving a few. Uh, you were giving a few tidbits. I'm like, if he mentions anything in this, really, <laughs> I haven't seen the quiz. Just to give the answers away, ready, Kevin. All right, guys. If we want to bring the first question up, so when was the first? When do you think the term Internet of Things was first coined? I was just waiting for. Like, where is the music? <laughs> it really can't be 2011. Can <coughs> I'll tell you. I'll bet Callum knows. I don't. Don't know. I don't actually know. No. I'd go 2002. I was going 2002 too. Actually, no. 
So 35% of you are right. The Internet of Things was actually first coined back in 1999. Oh, okay. It's always before we think. It was polite laughter. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Second question, please. By 2020, there will be an estimated XX number of connected devices. We know in 2005, it overtook the 3 billion. So. Yeah. <laughs> Are you telling me the answer? I really need to like, get off my phone. <laughs> 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 it's facts. Mm. Yeah, so <laughs> everybody, <laughs> How did right, you get that? Yeah, so everybody who got that wrong, that. obviously. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah so by, by an estimate, by 2020, an estimate of 30 billion, and I think that's quite conservative, if I'm honest. Mm. I think it'll be closer to 50. I put a tenner on it now. Mm. Um, if anybody wants to take me up on that book? <laughs> 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 20 to 1. <laughs> you think about the number of devices in our homes, and our wrists, and mm. our pockets. I've got, our, I've got a laptop, a mobile phone, an iPad, a wristwatch. I've got devices in the house that are connected to the Sonus internet. Sonus or Alexa. Mm. Or yeah. Or so, uh, yeah. Soon adds up. I think I've probably got about 20. Mm. If, if things go the way that they are in terms of the connected home, pretty much every single device that has a plug will be connected to the internet. Yeah. And mm. They'll all talk to each other in terms of energy consumption, water consumption. Bosch are even going to re release an augmented reality oven within the next few years. It looks like it's cooking, but it's not. Yeah, well, look, <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> so, it turns up. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> the display is internal within the oven. You can see through it, and the information revolves around the food as it's cooking temperature, how long there's left to go, whether or not there's any issues, all that kind of stuff. Just <coughs> within the... Wow. You can control it from your phone. Yeah. <laughs> if we can go to the... Um, <laughs> next question, please, guys. Maybe. Maybe not. Right, if you can see it, how many wearables were sold in 2015 alone? That includes <laughs> smartwatches, fitness trackers, VR headsets, wow. and connected phone devices. <coughs> wearables is an interesting one because it's a struggling marketplace. Mm. It's really transient as well. I've been through mm. God yeah. knows how many wearable, wearable wrist spots. I also can't, I'm not a wearables fan. I like the concept of them, but actually having one. Like so the correct oh, answer is actually no. 78 million That's just great. in 2015. Mm. Oh, I like it. Just in 2015, 78 million connected devices. Which shows you the opportunity in terms of tapping into that market as an organiser. It's 78 million opportunities. And last but not least, not least, the last question. What is widely considered one of the first Internet of Things objects ever? Mm. Cash machines, toasters, computers, or cameras? Everything used to be on a card, didn't it, on your camera in the old days, like a big fat card, and then it became an SD card, and then it... So the correct answer is actually cash machines, that is widely because they were communicating with each other to make yeah. sure that balances checked and things like mm. that. The cash machine, the ATM, which, if you actually look at back when ATMs first came out, that is even before 1999. When did yeah, they come I think, out? I think it was like the, <coughs> yeah, the 60s. No, I think it was 80s, I reckon. It was. Yeah, I'm in my... I'll, I'll, I'll check up on that. The rich kid. It could have been earlier, but I remember yeah. them in the 80s. I'm going to show my age. I can't even imagine like, a world where there's not cash machines. Did that, I, I, it's the first time I've even considered that that, that, that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to these guys for being a part of tonight's panel discussion. Made my job really easy. Um, if you guys want to ask these any more detailed questions, they will be outside, hopefully. Um, in the networking mm -hmm. lounge, we've got booze and nibbles out there. So stick around. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you.